I didn't want to have a brain fart. The presentation? Oh, yes, I'll keep the presentation up. Okay. Um, all right, hello everybody. Um, welcome to the webinar for our Lunch and Learn series today on Balancing on the Edge, the Ethics of Risk Assessment presented by Dr. Christy Eldridge and Aiden um, Rower. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong, Nutter? Rower, not Nutter. Yes, okay, cool. These will be our two presentations, presenters for today. Hi everyone, um, I'm Aiden and I am one of the doctoral students here at the Chicago School in the Counselor Education and Supervision Program. Um, I'm actually going to let Dr. Eldridge start us off with introductions. If you want to give us a more in-depth look at who you are, Dr. E? Sure, happy to. Um, I'm Dr. E, Dr. Eldridge. Happy to be here really um... <laughs> Really, uh, I guess, just riding the coattails of of Aiden as the expert in this presentation. So I'm thrilled to be here. I'm one of the, the core faculty in the counselor education online department at Chicago School, primarily in the CMHC program. Um, I also work in a private practice in Denver, Colorado. Um, and in my practice, I work mostly with survivors of complex trauma um, and the experience of, of suicide, suicidality, um, is is very much a, a main experience of survivors of, of complex trauma. So um, this is a, a topic that is a passion area for me, and I'm really thrilled that we're spending a good amount of time today uh, in talking about it. One thing, uh, Aiden, I hope you don't mind if I throw this in there. Um, when we talk about these topics, I mean, we want to we want to be really uh, clear and give you you all lots of information, and it's a lot, uh, you know, especially a topic of, with this heaviness. So we really encourage you to um, check in with yourselves as we go, practice your own self care. Um, if you need to take a, a quick break or a breather, grab a glass of water. Of course, just uh, we really want to encourage you to to stay true with, to yourselves and what you need as we go through this this heavy topic. And I'll I'll pass it back to Aiden. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, like I said, my name is Aiden and I'm one of the doctoral students. My dissertation is going to be around counselor self-efficacy when it comes to doing risk assessments and to engage clients who are in crisis situations. Um, in my professional life, I wear a couple of different hats. Um, I am first and foremost, I identify as a crisis counselor. Um, I do my best work working with clients in crisis moments. Um, working with people who are in some of the deepest, darkest places they can be in their lives. And I spend my days talking to folks about suicide, about homicide, grief, loss, trauma. Um, that's really where my expertise is. I do have a couple of different professional roles. Um, I am the compliance manager at Community Crisis Services in Iowa City, Iowa. I've been with community for about four or five years now. Um, I started off as the manager for our mobile crisis team, and then I went on to develop and manage a triage counseling program for a community-based mental health crisis center uh, that's called GuideLink. I actually moved to Amsterdam last year, so I had to go remote. Um, and I ended up working for our crisis helpline program. We are one of the largest centers answering for the phone, chat, and text lines for 988 when it launched last year. So I've been part of that implementation in Iowa and across the United States. And just recently, in the last couple of months, I became the compliance manager for the entire organization, which means my job is to look at what our organization is contracted to do, what we're funded to do, what we're legally supposed to be doing, um, and some of the laws around the work we do. Uh, what ethically we should be doing, and then what are the actual best practices. And then I help the, the different programs figure out like, okay, how are we actually going to help our clients? How are we actually going to help this community while still balancing all those different things? So 
it sounds like a lot, but I absolutely love the job. Um, I do live here in Amsterdam in the Netherlands where I own a private practice. I primarily see expats who are dealing with issues of immigration and identity, um, but I'm also working with a couple of refugee families around trauma. And then finally, I am a nationally registered EMT back in the United States. Um, I'm not practicing right now since I'm over here in Amsterdam, but I have been on the scene as a first responder when people have attempted or have died by suicide. Um, so unfortunately, this is a subject I'm very familiar with on a firsthand basis. Uh, just like Dr. Aldridge said, um, this is a tough topic. I mean, these are people's lives that we're talking about, and it can be triggering. So if you do start to feel overwhelmed, if it does start to feel like it's too much, you know, please step away, do something to care for yourself, and then just rejoin us when you're ready. Um, I was really debating over the last few weeks how I wanted to approach this presentation. There's so much to talk about. This is my passion area. I gave Dr. Eldridge the uh, green flag to interrupt me if I get on a tangent. Um, and the audience here, you guys are all at such different levels. We've got folks that are brand new CMHC students who have never gotten any training around suicide risk assessments to our veteran counselors and our crisis counselors where we talk about this all the time. Um, it was really hard to find a good balance with this presentation. And so what I thought I'd like to do is start us off um, with kind of the lecture part of the presentation first, get us all a baseline understanding of the ethics around suicide risk assessments, dig really deep into the ACA code of ethics, um, dig deep into KCREP accreditation standards, other ethical considerations. Um, just get us all kind of on the same page. And then towards the end, I thought we'd do something a little bit more fun, a little bit more interactive, and we're going to staff a case together. So, you know, we can learn these really great ideas from books and lectures and everything. But at the end of the day, we're here to work with people and we're here to figure out these situations. So I want us all to work together uh, to look at a case and figure out what we would do. So while we go through the lecture bit, eat your lunch, get some food in you, get your blood sugar up so you can do some hard thinking. Uh, and then we will dive into the scenario after that. Just gonna double check questions before I get started. Oh, yeah, I will throw my email in there when I get a chance. Okay. So I went with the title for this presentation, Balancing on the Edge, because doing a risk assessment with a client, whether that's a suicide or a homicide risk assessment, is a balancing act. Um, navigating risk with clients, it's kind of like trying to navigate a boat down a very narrow river at night where you aren't sure what you're going to run into, right? Um, and there's dangers on different sides of the river. Um, and there's two big dangers on each bank. On one hand, you can play it too safe um, and you can take very extreme action to try to keep your client safe. The risk of that though, is that you're isolating that client, you're fringing upon their rights, you're damaging the therapeutic alliance you spent so much time trying to build up and you're damaging not only their trust in you, but also in the system as a whole. Um, so sometimes we panic naturally because we care about our clients and we want to do what's right by them, but the steps we can take can do some real damage when it comes to their autonomy and their ability to, to dictate their own lives and the way things happen. Obviously, the other side of that is that if we're not cautious enough, if we don't do our due diligence, then we risk the client dying. I mean, that is the big risk, right, is that they could act on their thoughts of suicide and they could die by suicide. Um, and when it comes to homicide, you're not only potentially risking the client themselves, but also the other people around them. So these are not easy assessments to do. Uh, with any assessment that we do as counselors, there are risks in making a bad call and making a bad decision. And it's a lot on us. The thing is, when it comes to things like suicide and homicide, we don't get a choice. We don't get to say, oh, I'm never going to work with a suicidal client. You will. 
Um, so let's start off with that part that's in every lecture and that's statistics. You are going to work with a suicidal client because suicide is all around you. Uh, for those of you who already are practicing counselors, I can bet my career that you already have worked with a client who's had thoughts of suicide, uh, whether or not they've disclosed that to you. So from the latest data set that's been available from the Center for Disease Control and from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, uh, the, this data set came out in 2020. Suicide was the 12th leading cause of death in the United States. That's pretty significant considering that that data set came out in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. So suicide is still up there as a leading cause of death when we have people that were dying from the virus and people who are dying from things that we now know are related to the virus, like respiratory disease and heart failure. Um, it's going to be interesting in terms of suicide statistics, exploring the aftermath of the pandemic and the social distancing that we all went through over the last couple of years. But even from that time period, within particular groups, suicide is an even bigger problem. So suicide is the second leading cause of death in children ages 10 to 14, and in adults ages 25 to 34. It's the third leading or the third leading cause of death in 15 to 24 year olds, and it's the fourth leading cause of death in 35 to 44 year olds. So that's you know a pretty significant cause of death for some of our, our clients that are under the age of 50. And suicide definitely exists in those above the age of 50. Um, something that's important to note, and we're going to talk about why I bring this up, but the leading cause of death in 10 to 14 year olds and in 25 to 34 year olds is accidental injury deaths. Um, and that's going to be important in a couple of minutes. So in 2020, with that data set, 45,979 people in the United States died from suicide that year. Um, I like to put that in perspective. That's as if we lost a mid-sized town in the United States in one year. Um, so when I give presentations like this in Iowa, that's the equivalent of if we just lost Dubuque, Iowa in a year. Um, and I mean, just think of that in terms of the sadness of losing an entire town of people. For every person who does die by suicide, there are very many more who attempt suicide and survive. Um, so again, it was estimated in 2020 that 1.2 million suicide attempts happened in the United States. Obviously, you know, one person can have multiple attempts, but that's still a lot of people. And when you think about that in terms of human suffering and the amount of pain that people are in, that they are attempting suicide, it's not a small number. So that's just within the United States. Uh, suicide is a worldwide problem. Um, again, 2020 numbers, about 700,000 people died um, by suicide around the world in that year. Again, we're going to talk about why that's already a huge number, but it may be a little bit more than that. Even though suicide can happen to anyone and it does happen to um, countries across the world, it disproportionately affects people that are in lower and middle income countries. About 70% of suicide deaths happen in lower and middle income countries. So these are places where people already may not have ready access to mental health care, to counselors, uh, to psychiatric help. So that's something to think about in terms of equity and, and equity in accessing care. Uh, I said we talked a little bit more about statistics and why it's like, yeah, there's more to the story here. Um, Suicide has traditionally been a very hard topic to research because of all of the shame and the stigma around it. It's a very heavily stigmatized topic. And just now within our Western societies, we're starting to get to the point where we can have frank conversations like this about suicide and not shame the victim. Um, 
it was very common in the past to associate suicide with sinful behavior or associate it with crimes and criminal behavior. Um, it was not that long ago that a lot of states in the United States had laws on their books saying that suicide was a crime. Um, in fact, I think it was in Ireland up until about the mid 1990s, it was a crime that you could be jailed for to attempt suicide. Um, and in some areas of the world, you know, the bodies of people who have died by suicide aren't given proper funeral rights, they aren't given that proper respect at the end of life. Um, and, you know, that has huge impacts upon those people's families and society and the mourning process. I so, can, can I jump oh, in? Because yeah. oh, I know we were emailing about this a little bit, but I want to, to this um, point of how much shame and stigma is still associated with suicide. I mean, historically, so much, so much so, but there is a real effort uh, in the mental health community, in the advocacy community to, to do what we can to use language to try to destigmatize and decriminalize our, you know, this, the idea, the experience of, of suicide. So I want to point out to everybody as you listen um, to, to Iden and, and also to me, the language we use, we're not using the terms commit suicide commit implies this criminal act that, you know, that should be punished or um, stigmatized or, you know, shamed, sinful. So there's a real shift in our profession to move to die by suicide. So I just want to point that out as, as we're listening to Aiden to notice that. And also just noticing, you know, as Aiden's talking about the um, the heavy shame and stigma, we have our own biases too. So notice and maybe jot down as we're listening any automatic reactions that are coming up for you any they might be biased they might be fearful they might be reflective of the panic that we feel but just jot them down without judgment to kind of cultivate your own your own awareness of what comes up for you around this topic so thank you for letting me interrupt <laughs> of course no thank you um yeah that's a very great point about the language that we use and it i still slip out from time to time um the the idea of saying commit suicide is so ingrained in our culture that you know it it's second nature for all of us and it takes a conscious effort to make that switch but it's important to make that switch um so i definitely you know give yourself grace if you do make that slip up but we all grow we're all getting better together and you know it's important that we we really work on that language aspect so thank you factor e um so with all we just talked about, about shame and stigma, it's really difficult for people to come forward with their thoughts of suicide. There's a lot of fear of judgment. Um, they may be worried about the reactions of their families, worried about the reactions of society. They may be worried about um, your reaction and whether you're just gonna lock them up somewhere, which is the whole point of this presentation. <laughs> um, so, and even sometimes when people do come forward and they do share this extremely vulnerable moment with others, they're not treated well and they're not treated with respect, um, which makes them just want to, to clam up and stay silent even more. So how we interact with clients who disclose thoughts of suicide to us or disclose past attempts to us is really important in helping break down some of those barriers and break down some of that stigma. But it makes it very hard to get solid numbers on um, things like attempts when it comes to research around suicide. This is true for deaths as well. So in most states in the United States, unless a coroner can 100% say that yes, this was a suicide, a lot of times they will classify a death as an accidental or an unintentional death. And they do this to try to protect the family from some of that pain and stigma that comes with suicide loss. Um, there are people who act on their thoughts of suicide in ways to kind of disguise what they're doing to protect their families. Um, I've talked to a lot of clients who will use automobile accidents as their means of attempting suicide. And they do that because it, they just want it to look like it was an accident. Um, and that way they can spare their families knowing that they were in that much suffering. Um, there's also situations where it's impossible to tell whether or not a death was intentional or not. So we have things like 
you know, overdosing on drugs and alcohol, we don't know what the person's state of mind was when they took that overdose, if they were alone. And so it's really hard to say, was this just an accident and they took too much or, you know, they got something they didn't intend to get, or was this an intentional act? Um, there's also situations where people overdose on purpose and then they try to get help and unfortunately they're not able to do what we call self-rescue um, because they're they're impaired um, and they end up dying anyway. I've also worked with clients who've had traumatic brain injuries from past overdoses where um, they suspected that they overdosed on purpose, but they don't know because they can't remember the event. And the damage that was done to their brain from that overdose um, just makes it impossible for us to really dig into what their mindset was like during that time period. Overall, it's really hard to get solid numbers when it comes to suicide statistics. Um, and the consensus in the research world is that this is actually a much, much bigger problem than we're able to document. So why are we talking about this as counselors? Um, just because somebody is in mental health treatment, just because they're seeking out counseling and they're getting help and they're in front of you, doesn't mean they're suddenly safe from suicide. Um, there was a study that found that one in five people who died by suicide were receiving mental health care within a month of their death. So sometime in a month before they died, they were in front of a counselor or a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Um, one in three had received some form of mental health care within a year of their death. So getting care isn't enough to stop suicide. We're probably going to be the first people that clients tell about their suicidal thoughts because we're trusted, right? Our whole work is built on the sense of trust and respect for the person and hearing them out. And we're already working with them on some very tough topics. So we prove to them every time that we meet with us that we can be trusted um, and that we might be safe people to disclose to that they're having thoughts of suicide. And I'm talking a lot about suicide, but this goes for homicide risk as well. This puts us in a really awkward position um, because they can say, hey, when I leave your office tonight, I'm going to go home and I plan to kill myself. And then we're stuck going, I want to respect you and I want to respect your privacy and your confidentiality. But oh no, what do I do to keep you safe? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so we're going to dive really far into the ethics. We're going to talk about what the ACA expects of us. Um, what we kind of need to know legally, what our responsibilities are to the client, um, what our responsibilities are to ourselves. And like I said, eat your lunch, get your blood sugar up, because then once we get through that, we're going to get into an actual case and, and staff it together. So the first obstacle that we're going to run into on our journey is just knowing what to do. Do you know what to do if a client who's sitting in front of you tells you that they're going to hurt themselves, they're going to kill themselves, or that they're going to hurt or kill other people? Do you know how to assess the level of risk that they're at? Are you able to safety plan? Um, those sort of things. We're not going to dive into today the actual risk assessments themselves and how to do them. There are other trainings for that. If you're a CMHC student, you're going to get that as part of your program. Um, I'm going to give you some suggestions for places that you can look for extra training on that, but really just being honest with yourself of how comfortable would you feel knowing what to do if a client in front of you said that they were planning to kill themselves. We're going to start with what our code of ethics say, and that is that we need to practice within the boundaries of our own competence. We are only supposed to do those things that we actually are competent and know how to do based on our education, our training, our supervision, our credentials, our licensure, et cetera. Um, and we only are supposed to be doing assessments that which we have been trained and are competent to do. So CMHC students sitting out there, if you've not had any training on a suicide risk assessment, we're not gonna stick you in front of a client 
and expect you to just go with it, right? Um, this is part of the reason, at least here at the Chicago School, we cover suicide and homicide risk assessments pretty early in the curriculum. We start talking about it right away, but we really dive into it during that first residency period. And that's because we want you to get exposure and we want you to have time to get comfortable and build competence and practice and know what you're doing before you enter into internship and into practicum where you may actually encounter a client who's thinking about suicide. Now, when you are in practicum and you're in internship, um, you have your supervisor there. Your supervisor is who is responsible for doing that assessment, um, for you know helping with the safety planning with that client, but we just don't want you to go into it blind. Um, and that's why in our program, and I'm sure in other CMHC programs, you know, that gets covered fairly early in the curriculum. Oop. I always forget there's so many clicks in this. Come on, let me go back. Um, in fact, for KCREP accredited programs, having some kind of curriculum when it comes to suicide prevention um, and intervention is a requirement for accreditation. So students that are in a KCREP accredited CMHC program are expected to learn suicide prevention models and strategies, and they are expected to learn procedures for assessing risk of aggression or danger to others, self-inflicted harm or suicide. Goodness gracious, I don't have the usual. Uh... Another place that you learn about how to do these assessments is in supervision, um, which I mentioned. So when you're in that intern intern internship or practicum setting, you've got a supervisor there. And if you run into a situation where you need to do a suicide risk assessment, they're going to be helping you walk through that as an expert, as you know, somebody who's mentoring you. Um, but even when you're outside of the formal supervision setting, you've finished your schooling, you've finished internship practicum, maybe you finished those two or three years after your master's program where you're getting your supervision hours, you're still expected to continue to get consultation of some form when you're making these decisions. Um, these are not easy decisions, right? We're again, we're talking about a person's life and we shouldn't be in a silo working alone while making these choices. Um, so part of the ACA code of ethics um, in part C, we are expected to continually monitor our own effectiveness, our own skills, our own competency when it comes to the work we're doing. Um, and we're supposed to get feedback from peers about what we're doing. Um, and just see if there's any gaps in our knowledge, any suggestions they have, things they would have done differently. Um, I forget who it was. It may have been you, Dr. E, but during yesterday's Lunch and Learn session, the conversation about seeking out peer supervision. Yeah, it's just um, so critical. And, and just for everyone to just set that expectation that you will be consulting forever. <laughs> as long as you're in this field, you should expect to be regularly consulting. And there are so many different avenues for consultation that are available to us. Um, you know, in speaking, I, I guess one thing that comes up with consultation, especially around suicide, is how um, inadequate we can feel, how scared we might feel that we either already did make a mistake or that we should know more than we feel like we know. And in that fear, we might tend to isolate. And so I just really encourage, um, you know, everybody to re resist giving into that, that avoidance or that isolation and, and reach out. You can start by reaching out to a, a, you know, a professional peer and, or a former supervisor or a former faculty, uh, but just make sure you're reaching out for some kind of consultation. Okay. Certainly. That was one of the things that I really enjoyed in working in the mobile crisis program is that we would go out on calls in pairs. And so I had another counselor there with me. And even though I was managing that program and was you know, supposed to be the supervisor, I would still turn to that counselor and be like, hey, how do you think that went? Mm -hmm. You know, do you think I, what I said, was that on par? Should I have said something different? Um, 
and their feedback is just as valuable as anything else because they were there with me working with that client. So just continuing to to work and get that consultation and that feedback, just like you're saying. Yeah, this isn't work we can do by ourselves. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. um, finally, there's an expectation that we continue to grow, right? It's not like you just finish your master's program and you're done. Um, there's continuing education that happens and we're expected by the ACA to continue our education and to continue growing, not just to keep up our license, which is important, don't get me wrong, um, but we need to understand what's going on in the scientific research and the professional information that's out there. Um, so that's, you know, attending things like, say, lunch and learn about suicide ethics or, you know, attending conference presentations, attending classes, anything that we can do to sharpen our skills and to get better and to be better counselors. Um, this is my first shout out, and that is going to be a shout out for a training that's called ASSIST. ASSIST stands for Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training. Um, it's offered by Living Works. It's one of the oldest and most researched suicide intervention training programs, um, and it's offered worldwide. It's endorsed by SAMHSA. Full disclosure, I am a trainer for ASSIST, but I'm not an employee of Living Works or a representative of them. Um, but the reason that I I give the shout out and the reason I became a trainer for this program was because assist was the training that I took where all of a sudden it clicked for me how to do suicide risk assessments and to do safety planning. Um, and I had been a counselor for years before I took assist, but this for me was the, the training where I was like, oh, I now feel like I'm competent in talking to people about suicide. I feel like I'm competent in doing a safety plan with them and I feel ethical about the way that I go about it. Um, so it's one that I really believe in and I'm, I'm glad to see that it's becoming the standard for SAMHSA and for other government agencies. Um, it's also a training that's not just for clinicians. You don't have to be a mental health counselor for it. It is designed actually for lay people. Um, but it has enough value that I think that mental health counselors, we can definitely get something from it. Um, so, you know, if you, you end up leaving early or you leave here with anything, take a look, see if you can find an assist training in your area, see if it's for you. Um, but there's a place to start when it comes to continuing your education around this topic. So we kind of talked about like knowing what to do, being competent in this is kind of the first challenge. It's the first danger that we face on the river. Um, and then we come to two different sides of the river and we have to navigate in between those. On one side, there is our responsibility to the client to maintain confidentiality, to treat them with respect and treat their information and their privacy with their respect. But on the other hand, there is this concept of our duty to warn. Um, we're going to talk about these two things next, and I'm going to start us off with confidentiality. So confidentiality is a really big deal in our field, and making decisions where we have to break confidentiality is really tough, whether that's suicide, whether that's mandatory reporting, some other situation, like it's it really gets at the core of our work of building that therapeutic alliance with people and the trust that we build with clients. And then to have to potentially bring someone else in or break that confidentiality, break that trust when a client maybe doesn't want us to, that's gonna do damage. Um, and it can set us back in the process or maybe even cause the client to not come back to us at all. There's legal implications for breaking confidentiality as well. Um, there are protections that clients have under the law when it comes to counseling. So for example, people have a legal right to um, keep their protected health information private under HIPAA. So, you know, we have to operate within the bounds of HIPAA and some other privacy laws. And when we maybe have to break that, when we have to step outside and, and use those exceptions to the law and to the policy, it can be really nerve wracking. So sure enough, I've got ACA codes in here because this is what guides us. Um, 
Section B of the ACA Code of Ethics is just all about confidentiality and privacy because it is that important to our work. Um, we recognize that trust is the cornerstone to the counseling relationship. Counselors aspire to earn the trust of clients by creating a partnership, establishing and upholding appropriate boundaries, and maintaining confidentiality. And we communicate the parameters of confidentiality in a culturally competent manner so that our clients understand what they can expect. Um, so at the initiation of any counseling process during that first intake session and throughout the counseling process, continually as you work in this relationship with this client, we're informing clients about the limitations of confidentiality and we are specifically identifying those situations where confidentiality might need to be breached. Um, we're gonna talk about informed consent in a bit. This is a big part of that as well. So I always devote a, a part of my intake sessions with clients to talking specifically about the limitations of confidentiality and what clients can expect, especially because I tend to see clients that have dealt with past lots of suicide. Um, that way, anytime we end up walking into a conversation where safety, duty to warn, whether or not we have to bring someone else in is in question, um, I can kind of remind them of the conversation we've already had about confidentiality. Um, again, it's building that partnership with a person. It's giving them the respect as a person. Um, respecting the story they have to tell, respecting the vulnerability that they bring to counseling um, and working in as a team in a partnership with them so that you're not hiding anything, you're not lying to them, you're being open and honest throughout the process. Um, so just being open and honest, explaining the limits of confidentiality so the clients know what to expect goes a long way towards keeping that trust. And when you're upfront with clients like that, when they know what to expect and you've been honest with them, it's much more likely they're going to trust you and they're going to open up with you about tough things like suicide and homicide. That being said, there are exceptions um, to the code of ethics. So I talked a little bit already about the explanation, how we go through the counseling process and we explain the limits of confidentiality. Um, but there are exceptions within the code of ethics when it comes to breaking confidentiality. In particular, section B2A is about for serious and foreseeable harm or legal requirements. It allows us in situations to break confidentiality if we really do believe through our professional assessment of the situation that there is a risk of serious and foreseeable harm in the immediate future to the clients or to others if we keep the information we know secret. Um, there's also some exceptions when it comes to end of life decisions and serious communicable diseases. That's more in the weeds that I'm gonna get into today, um, but worth reviewing the ACA Code of Ethics if you work with clients who maybe are at end of life or dealing with chronic illness um, or with clients that are dealing with communicable illnesses like HIV and AIDS and things like that. Even when we have to disclose, even when there's some situation when we need to break that confidentiality, um, a part of the code that's also important to keep in mind is this idea of minimal disclosure. So to the extent possible, we are informing clients before we share any confidential information and we try to involve clients in that decision-making process. So let's say you have a client who discloses to you that they are thinking about suicide, they're serious, they intend to act on these thoughts, um, they have the means, they have it planned, they figured out time, um, they have access to those means and they're just not willing to safety plan with you at all. Every attempt that you make, they're just like, no, I'm going to do this. Then we move from the safety planning aspect to a more of a collaborative process of figuring out like, okay, how do we get other people in here to help us? Because I'm, you know, this isn't working. I'm not enough and that's okay. Sometimes you need other experts there to help you. Um, 
so whether that's getting the client to the hospital or getting them to another setting or getting them in front of another professional, you want to see to what extent possible you can work with them. Um, the more you involve the client in this decision, the easier it's going to be to carry out whatever uh, the process is, but it's also going to be easier to repair that relationship in the future um, and to rework and regain that respect um, and trust with the client. So we just don't blab everything that the client tells us to the emergency responders. Um, let's say that you do need to call for an ambulance to transport a client to the hospital because they don't feel they can keep themselves safe and they don't feel like they can drive themselves safely to the hospital. You're not going to look at the EMT who shows up on scene and be like, oh, yeah, hey, um, this is Billy. Billy's in therapy with me because he cheated on his wife and now he's suicidal. No, that's not ethical. That's gossiping. It's not OK. Um, it's way too much information. It's not pertinent to keeping Billy safe. Um, and it also imagine if Billy is you know, standing behind you and just heard you tell some stranger that he's cheating on his wife, like so much damage right there in that one little interaction. So you keep to the facts and you keep to the facts that are important for that professional to know in order to keep the client safe. Hey, this is Billy. I'm his counselor. He disclosed to me today that he's having thoughts of suicide and we tried the safety plan, but we weren't able to come up with a plan that doesn't allow him um, that allows him to stay safe without going to the hospital. We'd like assistance getting him to the hospital because he doesn't think he can drive himself and stay safe. That is all the information that the EMT needs to know. And I can say as an EMT who's showed up to those scenes, I'm going to then turn to Billy and go, hey, I'm really glad you opened up today. Let's get you into the back of the ambulance. I'm going to ask you a couple of medical questions that your counselor doesn't need to know because I've got my own privacy considerations. Um, and then we'll just get you safely to the hospital. That's the whole interaction. You do not need to share with the, the EMT, with the police officer, with the mobile crisis team, whoever shows up, all of the details of the sessions and the work that you've been doing with the client, you only need to share what is relevant to the current crisis. Um, so we know we can break confidentiality in those situations where there is foreseeable um, and serious future harm to the client or others, and when that client is not able to stay safe. So that's where we get to this idea of the duty to warn. And this is a section I purposely don't have a huge amount of detail on the slides because duty to warn and what your duty is um, is a legal thing that varies from state to state and from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So depending upon where you live and where you're practicing, what duty to warn means and the extent that you have to go to will vary a lot. Um, so in general, if during the course of your assessment, you believe that a client is at serious and foreseeable risk of killing themselves, of harming or killing other people, um, you're expected to take steps that are within reason to keep them safe. Again, depending upon the state that you're in, what is within reason is going to be up to the state laws and standards. Um, and it's really important for you to kind of do your research around what your state expects. But there is a little bit of an ethical decision here. And that is what happens if we don't say anything and the worst happens and somebody gets hurt or dies. And the reverse, what happens if we do say something and the client gets upset with us and feels like their rights were violated? And that's where we get into the ethical decision-making models, uh, like the one that the ACA gives to us. Anytime you're making a decision like this to break confidentiality, um, especially when you're breaking it and the, the client doesn't want you to, you want to have used an ethical decision-making model to make that decision. Um, it gives us a system to figure out what are the consequences of a particular action or inaction? Um, who can we consult with? What are the relevant ethical standards? What are the relevant laws that we need to consider? And it really walks you through making that choice. Um, 
you know, goodness forbid you ever do find yourself in front of a court and you have to defend a decision that you've made um, regarding breaking confidentiality, you want to be able to say, I used this decision making model. Here are the ethical standards that I used. Here are the laws I considered. Um, this is the expertise, the knowledge, the competency that I have. And this is what I use to base my decisions off of. These are the people I consulted with. You're going to present this almost like evidence as to why you made the choices that you did. So get to know those ethical decision making models. Um, like I said, the ACA has got one. There's some other ones out there in the research. Figure out how are you going to make a choice like this if you ever do have to. All right. So a lot of talking for me. I don't usually do this amount of talking, right? Counselors, other people are supposed to be doing more talking than us, but I promise we're almost through. Um, so I touched on this a little bit, but um, another part that's tied very closely to confidentiality is informed consent. So our clients have a right to decide whether or not they engage with us. Um, we can't force them into counseling, even if they are mandated to go to counseling for some reason. Um, they have a choice whether or not to go. It's just there might be consequences if they choose not to. And that's what this informed consent process looks like. Um, so part of the ACA Code of Ethics, Section A2A on informed consent. So clients have the freedom to choose whether or not to enter into a counseling relationship, and they need adequate information about the process and the counselor. They need to know what to expect. That includes things like the limitations of confidentiality, what they can expect from you, what knowledge you have, what credentials you hold, um, what you're going to do in certain circumstances. And that informed consent process starts at that initial intake appointment, sometimes even before. Sometimes I typically will send an explanation of informed consent and confidentiality before the first appointment for clients to review. And then I go over it in the intake appointment. Um, but it doesn't end there. We are constantly refreshing and talking about informed consent and different aspects of informed consent as we're working through um, the counseling process with the client. Um, part of this is like during that first assessment talk or that intake session talking about what happens um, when a client discloses thoughts of suicide or thoughts of homicide to you. Now, depending upon the client, how in detail you get in that explanation will vary. So if you have a client that's coming to you purely for career counseling, not mental health related, you know, you might bring it up. It's still important to bring it up because any client can be having thoughts of suicide, but your explanation might be shorter. You know, it might be like, hey, I know you're going through the job search process. You're, you know, figuring out your career. That is an extremely stressful situation. Um, I do want to let you know it's normal. Sometimes people have thoughts of suicide when they're going through this process. And I want you to feel comfortable coming to me to talk about those if it does happen. We'll work through it together, you know, or we'll take steps together to figure out who else we can involve to keep you safe. So it can be very simple and straightforward like that. And you may never need to come back to that topic. Now, if you have a client you're working with who um, specifically mentions they have a history of suicidal ideation and attempts, you're probably going to go into a lot more detail with them about what the process looks like if they disclose suicidal thoughts. So I'll talk to them more about my process for doing an assessment, the things that I consider, what safety planning looks like, um, and just reiterating with them that I want to work with them, that it's important to me to be on a team and in a partnership with them, but also explaining those situations where I may have to call for outside help even if the client doesn't consent to it. Um, just like with confidentiality, when the client understands their rights and understands informed consent, it's not a surprise to them. Um, they're going to trust you a little bit more and they're actually more likely to want to work with you when it comes to uh, topics such as suicide and homicide. 
I think uh, in real quick. Yeah, please. I'm just thinking of, um, you know, how I talk to my clients of, about this because it can be, we're going through our, you know, our informed consent form. We're talking about limits of confidentiality and these circumstances. This is when I would have to, uh, you know, break our confidential. And, and sometimes it can become a little rote and like, we're just like checking off the list. Uh, and it seems like it's much more therapeutic if we can, I mean, of course we have to hit on those required topics, but if we can make it into a conversation, also saying like, that doesn't mean we don't get to talk about suicide. I want you to know, like, sometimes this can feel a little scary to clients. Like, oh, if I talk about suicide, you're going to send me to the hospital. And so I'll, I'll kind of name those fears that I've heard from some clients and say, that's, that's not actually the case. This is a place where we can talk about suicide um, and any thoughts that you might be happen that you might be having. And here's when that conversation might evolve into some different types of action. And here's how we would do it, or here's how I would like to do it. You know, we, we want to make it a collaborative process. In, in all cases, we want to do everything we can to protect your confidentiality and protect your safety. So sometimes that's a hard, I mean, your title's perfect. Sometimes that's a hard line to walk, but here's what we would do. Because sometimes when they're just hearing the consent form, they're taking everything in. And if this is a first session, it's all overwhelming. And they maybe have never even talked about any of this with anybody before. So they're even wondering, like, oh, are you going to get mad at me? Am I going to get in trouble? Are you going to lock me up? Do you think I'm crazy? So really trying to normalize and give them even more information than is required in our our checklist or our limits of confidentiality, I find that to be um, therapeutic and trauma-informed too, to give them all of that information. And then to say like, what do you think? <laughs> what are your thoughts? Any fears, any concerns? Have you gone through this, you know, with any other therapist before? What was that like? And just bringing it into the conversation can be, it, you know, it all feeds that therapeutic alliance right from the beginning. Yeah, exactly. Um, I remember reading um, some of the intake paperwork when I had gone to counseling for myself. And of course, I pay attention to uh, things having to do with suicidal disclosures and stuff like that, because my my work. And I remember for the, the counselor that I was going to, she had in there that like, you know, if we talk about suicide, I may have to um, call an ambulance and get you sent to the hospital. And I remember reading that and being like, oh my gosh, that is a really big step to go from mm -hmm. just talking about suicide to hospital. Yeah. The hospital. Um, and so I brought it up with her during the initial intake session. And I was like, hey, I, when I was reading through your paperwork, I saw this and it actually made me not want to come today. Can you tell me about this? And she explained exactly like you were saying what her process is that it's not just immediate to hospital, um, all the steps that we would go through. And I 100% went with her because, you know, I was able to see the person. She was able to explain it to me as another human. So I understood. Mm -hmm. um, and I got a sense of like, oh, okay, this is somebody who's not going to just lock me up. Is she yeah. somebody I can trust? But had you not had that um, voice or that confidence to advocate and ask more, yeah, even, yeah. yeah, that's, that's pretty intimidating for, for a new client. Yeah. Um, so that's also something to think about too, is that if you're working for an agency and they have standardized forms when it comes to confidentiality, to informed consent, et cetera, really reading that and making sure you can explain what that means to the client, um, cause their language may not be the language you would have used. Exactly. Yeah. Great point. Wow. You know, as we talk about this, there are certainly cultural considerations when it comes to talking about suicide and um, homicide risk assessments. And that's part of the ethical um, work that we have to do is considering the culture that our clients come from. So there's a lot that you know, goes into culture and suicide and death and grief, mourning, all that. It's more than I can get into today. But it is important to consider the cultural backgrounds of our clients um, when we start to have conversations with them about suicide. So, I mean, most of us know um, 
a lot of religious backgrounds have this idea of suicide as a sin, not all, but a lot. Um, and that suicide is something evil that, you know, you're going to be damned for it. There's consequences, et cetera. So when a client comes from that religious background, there can be even more of a sense of shame, of secrecy, of privacy, of like, you, you don't talk about this. Um, and it can be really tough for them to open up to you. So um, that is something to consider when you're working with them is just being that safe, open presence where they can bring it up and they're not worried about judgment from you. They're not worried that you're going to turn around and condemn them. It's also important to, to think about the ways that they may or may not be comfortable talking in front of family about suicide, especially, you know, if the family is also very religious. Um, they may be comfortable talking to you individually about their thoughts, but they don't want to mention it in front of their family. Um, there's also considerations when it comes to grief and mourning and loss when they've lost a loved one to suicide and how religion can play into that. Um, now, if you know that a client comes from a cultural group that stigmatizes suicide or condemns it, this doesn't mean you get to get out of the conversation. Um, if you have a client that you are concerned about, you need to ask them about suicide and you need to ask directly to make sure that you get a clear answer. Um, one of the things I work with students and with counselors at my organization that I train a, a lot around is asking directly about suicide. Don't ask if they're thinking of harming themselves. Don't beat around the bush. Ask the client directly, hey, are you having thoughts of suicide or are you having thoughts um, of killing yourself? But from there, how you adapt your assessment and how you would go about safety planning with them might be influenced by culture. So, you know, in this case, we might look for safety and social supports um, from a religious leader if I know that my client is particularly religious and having that faith-based support might help keep them safe. That being said, we don't turn our clients into stereotypes. Um, it's equally important to see where the client stands in terms of their own personal beliefs as an individual, as it is to know the cultural group and identities that they come from. So you're going to want to ask details like, hey, how does your religion address suicide? Or what are the views of your religion around suicide? Get that sense of the background that they come from. But then you also need to ask, so where do you stand in this? What are your personal views? Um, it's a trap that we sometimes fall into is assuming that the client's views are going to match perfectly with the cultural group that they come from. And that's not the case. Um, and there can be a lot of dysregulation and discomfort for clients when their views don't match up with the cultural views that they uh, grew up with or the, the groups that they currently belong to. Um, to you as a counselor, you need to explore both sides of that. You need to explore the background that the client is coming to you from, but also who is that client as a person, as an individual. And part of this is also checking in on our own cultural uh, identities and uh, beliefs and biases. Even, you know, when we started and said, like, just write down some of the reactions you're having. This is this is a one of those areas where many counselors will have strong feelings and reactions, and um, you know, in in various dynamics, you might be working with a client who their religious beliefs are very um, very much tied to negative consequences, and in your desire to comfort them, you you might overstep and say that's not going to happen. You know, you're, you're not going to hell, you know, that might be what's evoked in you, but does that make it appropriate? No, because there's your cultural um, lens coming in. So it's really knowing like what might come up for me, what belongs to my cultural identity and how do I make sure that I still show up for this client based on their cultural identity. Um, and then you go to supervision or consultation and process like, gosh, I'm really, I'm really scared because I do believe this, this, or that, or because I, it hurts my heart that they believe this and I don't believe that. But 
you know, it all needs to be, we, we need to be aware of, of all of it and our, of ourselves as a active part of that cultural process. Yes, exactly. Um, I can't count the number of times where I've been on a mobile crisis call or in a crisis situation where I've had a client tell me, you know, I would never die by suicide because, um, because of my faith, because of my religion. And I have this immediate kind of reaction that I know about myself now where I'm like, oh, you should want to live for yourself and for other reasons, not because you're scared of a consequence. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to realize like, oh, that is very much a cultural bias of my own is this idea that like it must come from an internal source, mm -hmm. right? Rather than, but I'm not respecting the client and I'm not respecting their religious views by by doing that. At the end of the day, if their faith is what keeps them safe, they're safe. And that's good. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just like Dr. Alters was saying, just being aware of where we're coming from and the assumptions that we hold. Um, and at the end of the day, those may not be serving the client that we are trying to keep safe. So autonomy, this is this is my soapbox topic. I'm going to be straight up with you about that. Um, is, you know, what power and what choices are we actually giving the client in these situations? Like I said earlier, it is natural, especially as if we're a new counselor and we're new to this role, we've not done that many suicide or homicide risk assessments we kind of panic a little because these are scary and they're intense and that's normal to be feeling that kind of pressure when these situations pop up. Um, and unfortunately, that tends to cause us to take actions that go on that side of the river where we're being too safe. Um, and we don't consider things like client autonomy and client choice in the matter. And I, hopefully as you've been been listening, you'll notice this trend we talk about, about working with the client, right? Because ultimately the outcome is going to be better for them if they feel like they have choices, that they're guiding this decision, that they're making the path for themselves and you're just helping with that process rather than you telling them, oh, you're going to the hospital. Um, so really understanding where in this process the client gets to exercise their autonomy and gets to make choices for themselves. Part of the way we can do that is just understanding what choices there are. So we've talked a lot about hospitalization, but hospitalization is not the only option when it comes to staying safe from suicide. Um, in fact, it really should kind of be your last resort. The role of psychiatric hospitalization in the United States for the most part is just to serve as a short-term solution to keep someone safe from very intense suicidal or homicidal thoughts until the crisis passes and they're able to continue with other care systems. Um, not everybody needs that. And so that's where learning how to safety plan and figuring out the level of risk that the client's at, how intense their thoughts are, how intent they are on acting on their thoughts, that's where this all comes into play. And you can help by knowing what care options and what safety options are available to you and available to the client in your community. So I mentioned that I manage the mobile crisis team, and I'm always a little surprised that people don't know more about mobile crisis. Um, but mobile crisis, it, it varies state to state, how it works, how it operates, look how it works and operates in your state. But in Iowa, um, with the mobile crisis program, we are highly trained counselors that specialize in suicide and homicide risk, as well as other crisis care. We go out in pairs, we talk to people, it's completely voluntary. Um, we do not get involved in the committal process or anything like that. Um, but we're meant to be an extra set of support, and we've gotten additional training and additional education around safety planning and around figuring out the best ways to support clients in these crisis moments. So we're an option. Um, and I've gone to therapist's office as a mobile crisis counselor. That is totally okay. You do not have to do it alone as 
the counselor, you can call in mobile crisis and be like, hey, I think I need, and my client needs another perspective here. Would you be willing to come meet with us? Yeah, I'm totally on board to do that. Um, so just figuring out what is available in your area, figuring out how it works in your area. Um, in some areas, mobile crisis is independent. Like in Iowa, they're independent entities run by nonprofit organizations. Um, I was talking to someone the other day and in New Mexico, mobile crisis or crisis teams are associated with law enforcement. So, you know, that's something to consider if you've got a client who's maybe a little fearful or anxious when it comes to law enforcement presence. Um, and just being able to understand what's available and being able to explain that to the client and see if you can get their buy-in, see if they'd be willing to consider that option. Um, we always want to aim for the least restrictive option out there. So, you know, let's say you do call in mobile crisis and they're talking to your client and it still ends up that the client needs to go to the hospital that's okay. You were still trying to do the best thing for the client. It ended up that the hospital was the best choice. And you now have, you know, confirmation from other professionals that, you know, that was the best choice for the client. Um, and you may have a little bit more buy-in from the, the client because he's got now three professionals in front of him being saying like, hey, I think hospitalization might be the best choice. So, just consider what's available to you. Um, understand what the different resources are out there and what you can offer the client in terms of care. One thing I will say for, for choice and a resource that I give to every client is 988. So 988 is now the national um, suicide and crisis lifeline number. It works in every state. What happens when you call 988 is it tries to connect you with a center that's the closest to where you're calling from um, so that you get somebody you know in your state who's going to understand the options available. If there's nobody immediately available within the state, then you get bounced to a national counselor who will still have access to state resources. They just, they're more jack of all trades rather than specialized in that state. Um, 988 is free, it's confidential, um, it's available 24 seven. So that's an option, say client goes home after your session, their suicidal thoughts return, they get worse, they can call 988 and access crisis counselors that way. Um, and a lot of states are 988 lines now, we can actually, um, interface with mobile crisis teams. So in the state of Iowa, if we have somebody call us on the 988 number and you know they want somebody physically out there to talk to them through their crisis, we can get mobile crisis out to them. We're able to do that dispatch now. Um, some states are even integrating 911 and 988. So um, in Iowa right now, we're working on a way that when somebody calls 911 and it doesn't need police response, it doesn't need an ambulance response, but it maybe needs mobile crisis or needs a crisis counselor, they can then transfer the client directly to 988 and get them talking to somebody more appropriate. Um, so again, that's another resource just to have in your back pocket to share with clients. Another thing to consider that's important with autonomy is timing, is knowing what the client needs right now. You can be the most amazing, experienced, knowledgeable, credentialed, whatever counselor in the world. And nothing you say is going to keep your clients safe from suicide for the rest of their lives, right? Things change. You know, the moment they leave your office or they leave the Zoom with you, they're going back into the environment that's causing them stress. They're going back to those day to day um, situations that maybe led them to thinking about suicide. And our hope is that we've given them the skills, we've given them the perspective and, and help them figure out ways of coping with the stressors they're returning to, but they're still returning to those stressors. And we can't just take everybody and lock them up in the hospital for the rest of their lives. That's also not ethical. Um, so part of 
of client autonomy and part of doing these risk assessments is having a little bit of trust in your client sitting with a little bit of discomfort and knowing that yeah you know they may go home with a safety plan and that safety plan may not work all the way and they may have to go to the hospital later that night and that's okay we're still trying to give them options and give them choices and we can only assess where they are right in that moment that they're sitting in front of us we have no idea what they're going to be like you know a week from now so really focusing your assessment on where the client is in the moment that you are working with them. And we'll we'll circle around this in the self-care um, topic as well. But this, you know, to the, you can't lock them up in the hospital for the rest of their lives. You also can't promise to check in with them every day for the rest of their lives. You know, this it's a pitfall for for counselors, again, out of that anxiety and out of that sense of a responsibility or burden that actually violates their autonomy. You know, when we take all of the responsibility on ourselves, I'm the counselor, I need to make sure my client is safe or else I'm not a good counselor. Then we cross those boundaries. And, you know, if they're like, well, I just need to check in with you at the start of every day, or I just need 15 more minutes um, in session, or, you know, like those are slippery slopes that move you into being more responsible for their their life and their safety than they are and that's not good for them and it's definitely not good for for us either um so I often you know I often just think like I'm not going to follow my clients home that that's totally inappropriate so I'm going to do the best I can do um within the boundaries of my professional role and then, like you said, I didn't like, I'm going to, I'm going to trust that they are their own person and um, they are going to make the choices that they are going to make. Yeah. Which is hard. Which is hard and it's uncomfortable, but I think just like you said, you know, we have to, to give that power back to them and give that respect that they can act in a way to keep themselves safe. Um, and trust them when they say, like, hey, yes, I'm going to use the safety plan that we developed together. Uh, that trust goes both ways. We want them to trust us, but we also need to trust them to an extent. Um, you can't be on your cell phone and you can't be available for clients 24-7. I think that's I, every time I hear a new counselor say, oh, yeah, I gave my client my cell phone number. I cringe a little bit on the inside because that is a very hard boundary for me. Um, and you know that's why having resources like an after hours line, like 988, uh, like other local crisis lines are important so that when you're not available, because you cannot be available all the time, they do have some place they can turn to and they have power to identify, oh, here are the resources I can access on my own. All right, I see that there are some comments in the chat. We have one more section and then I'm gonna jump to questions before we go into our scenario. Um, I don't think that self-care is gonna be a surprise to anyone who's been to any presentation on mental health counseling in the last 10, 20 years, but self-care is important in this topic too. Even though it is our client who is thinking about suicide, these are tough, tough conversations for us. Um, so really being aware of where you are emotionally, where you are mentally, um, both before going into a session, but also especially after go coming out of a session, talking about suicide or homicide, just being able to, um, assess where you are. Also being very open with yourself about any personal experiences with suicide or homicide that might be impacting you. Most of us got into this work because of some sort of personal experience or family experience, or we, a friend, a neighbor, what have you, um, particularly among crisis counselors, a lot of us gravitated to crisis work because we have some kind of personal experience. It doesn't mean that we can't do this work. But if we do have that personal experience around suicide or homicide or, or familial experience, we have to put more work into self-care and we have to be monitoring ourselves, be monitoring our moods, be monitoring our biases 
uh, like Dr. Eldridge talked about and the, the things, the assumptions we have in the back of our head that may not be serving our clients well. Turns out the ACA has something to say about that and that comes to impairment. So we are expected to be continuously monitoring ourselves for signs of impairment, whether that's physical, mental, or emotional. And we are expected to stop offering services if we are impaired. Um, this can include things like having a, uh, a coworker or a peer that helps kind of monitor and check in with you. That's again, why supervision and consultation are so important because your peer might be able to kind of call you out and be like, I'm noticing you're reacting to this case. Let's talk about this. Um, and you need to be prepared that if it becomes too much, if it becomes too overwhelming for you, that you're taking a step back. Uh, you do this as much for yourself and to protect yourself, which is just as important, but you also do it to protect your clients um, so that you can make those tough ethical decisions with a clear mind and without any form of impairment. So self-care is a huge part of doing this work. It's just as important as showing up to the office, right? Sometimes taking that sick day is just as important as, you know, showing up. Um, and understanding too what your triggers are, what your past experiences are, what your biases are, the things that are contributing to your reactions when you're working with clients who are having thoughts of suicide. Um, one thing I always used to do and have was have a serious kind of thought conversation with myself before I started every day of if the first client I work with comes in and tells me that they are going to immediately act on a suicide plan the moment they leave my office, am I ready for that? And then not only am I ready for that, but am I going to be able to continue working after it? So having those tough conversations with yourself and, and figuring out um, how you're going to care for yourself through this process. A way that you do that is empowering yourself through continuing education. Um, getting more information about how to effectively do suicide and homicide risk assessments, how to effectively safety plan with clients, uh, knowing those options that are available within your practice area, just getting experience with this work so that you know what to expect, you know what you need in terms of self-care, you're starting to notice the things that get brought up for you when you start to talk about suicide and homicide. And that way, when you're actually there with a client, you've got a plan in place to take care of yourself and focus on them. One thing I think counselors don't realize, you can volunteer on the crisis lines if you want experience uh, talking about suicide with people and working with people through crisis situations. A lot of local crisis lines and some of the um, different crisis services do take volunteers. We also take employees. I am thrilled when I get a counselor that you know wants to join our crisis lines and work part-time because I'm like this is great you're bringing your knowledge and your expertise and we're going to show you our process um, too with how we have these conversations which I believe biasedly that is going to make them a better counselor later on um, so you know think about are there ways that you can get some experience um a lot of mobile crisis teams particularly the ones run by nonprofits um we have you know salaried counselors that are on the team all the time but we also have contingent counselors so the the program I work for we had counselors in our area who were on call to respond to clients um and they got to pick how many hours they worked a week or what shifts that they worked. So they could work within the, the boundaries of their energy levels and their other full-time jobs and things like that. So I had some counselors who were like, yeah, I've got a light caseload right now. I'd like some extra money and I'd like some experience working in crisis. And they'd pick up, you know, a couple of shifts a week with us with mobile crisis. Um, I had a couple of counselors who opened private practice and they're like, well, we don't have any clients right now. They took 40 hours a week full of mobile crisis and they, you know, then started to pare down their hours as they 
got more clients onto their caseload. Um, and then I had some other counselors who were like, yeah, I've got a full-time job, you know, working as a counselor, but I want to keep the skill set sharp. I'm going to take one or two shifts a month, if that. So, you know, think about that. Think about where are there areas that you can empower yourself, get that experience, get that knowledge. Um, and ultimately, that's going to help you feel better when you go into these really tough situations. Okay, I'm exhausted from talking, so I'm going to take a look at the questions, and then we're going to jump into the fun part. Well, all of the questions or comments in the chat right now are more logistical, but I wonder if we can yeah, kind of take a breather for you, especially um, you've been given such valuable information and do just an audience check in, like what's coming up for you? What are you still wondering about? Um, any reactions, like check in with your bodies? Where, do, where are you feeling, you know, kind of the weight of this conversation? which doesn't have to be a negative feeling. It can, you know, be like, oh, I could do this empowerment. So what, and you're welcome to come off mute too and, and chat with us as well, if anybody wants to. So how's everybody doing? I know one thing that was coming up for me, Aiden, when you were just talking about the, uh, you know, empowerment is just the reality of we might, um, we might feel safer in an avoidance response of like, well, I don't want to be a crisis counselor. Like that's too much. I'll leave that to, to you. You're the expert. You're, you're really good at it. I wouldn't be that good, but the empowerment does come from stepping into it and saying, okay, I do feel scared. I do feel ill-equipped. Let me pursue this extra, extra training so that so that I can shift that avoidance to empowerment. Yeah, and I encourage people all the time to to try working in a crisis counseling situation. So I actually started my career as a school counselor, um, and even though I had come into it wanting to focus on mental health and some of the things that emerged during childhood in terms of uh, mental health. Um, I just by, you know, a series of job changes ended up working at an adult psychiatric unit. And it really opened my eyes of like, I, I actually really like this work. I like working with people. Um, during these moments, there's a lot of power that comes from being with people when they're in these deep, dark places and just giving that uh, human connection to them. Um, and that's what ultimately led me to joining the mobile crisis team. And then the moment I was in mobile crisis, I was like, yes, this is me. This is my niche. This is my passion. Like it just went from there. I would have never expected that when I first entered my program as a, a for counseling and, you know, eventually school counseling. So give it a try. You know, if you get a, an opportunity to volunteer, you get an opportunity to work for a mobile crisis team. If you've got an opportunity to do an internship or practicum in a crisis setting, see what that feels like. Cause it's, it may be scary. It might be intimidating. It might be a lot to take on, but it might end up being your calling. Uh, and I see Frida, you've got your hand raised. Do you want to come yeah. off mute? I'm off now. Um, I wanted to share that years ago when I was working as an AP, I had a regular customer that I saw weekly who was diagnosed with bipolar and schizophrenic. And on a, that particular day, I had heard that in the past she had tried, the past was years ago, had attempted suicide a few times. I was there and our activity for today was to take her out to uh, different places where she wanted to apply for a job. So I took her to apply for jobs. Um, we stopped at a restaurant and had dinner and I took her home. It was very shortly after I took her home, her stepfather found her and she had attempted suicide. 
And that was a big, it, it was a big shock to me because she was not at all um, appearing as though she felt down or anything. My supervisor later told me that sometimes people, when they have a plan and they have worked their plan through, they know what's gonna happen and they're really happy. They're really upbeat. So an upbeat um, attitude is no reason to think that they're not gonna commit suicide. That was very scary for me. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us and honoring us with the, your story. Sorry, mm -hmm. Dr. E, I interrupted no, you. No, no, you're good. I, I just, that sounds like a really hard experience, Frida. Yeah. And I think that, you know, Frida, you really bring up that point of suicide can impact anyone, right? It's not always the people that we expect that, you know, maybe are showing the, the typical signs of depression or, um, you know, all these stereotypes we have around suicide, it can be people that appear on the surface to be just fine. Um, uh, again, this is more than I'd want to get into in this, but when we think about, you know, celebrity deaths, like with Robin Williams, everybody talks about how happy he was and how much joy he brought to the world and humor and, you know, how, how could he have been somebody to die by suicide? Um, and I think that goes to show why it's important that we have these conversations with clients, even clients maybe that we we aren't suspecting. Um, but yeah, I mean, such a, a painful moment. And thank you for sharing that with us. Welcome. And Natasha is offering um, the CAMS training, a training that she's done, the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality. Is that one that you're familiar with, Aiden? It is. It's one I've taken. Um, I really like CAMS as well. That's another one that um, I would recommend, the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidology. There's a, I don't know, of course, the name of it is escaping me. Now, uh, it's not officially a version of CAMS, I don't think, but it's heavily based off of CAMS. But there's also a similar training that is specific to um, the assessment and management of suicidality in clients that are also experiencing substance use disorders. Um, which I, gosh, if I remember the name, I'd also recommend that one because it's really, really good. Um, so yeah, thank you, Tasha. That one's a great one. Um, another one I will throw in before we switch over to the, the scenario um, is CALM. So counseling on access to lethal means. It is a free mm -hmm. online training. Um, and it is specifically about how to talk to people and safety plan um, around suicide when there are firearms involved. So guns and firearm use is the most lethal means of suicide. That is where the vast majority of fatalities happen um, is involving guns. So CALM is a really, a really good training that I appreciate it. Um, that talks about how to have those conversations, how to respect client views on firearms, because, you know, I come from the Midwest. Firearms are a big deal in uh, Midwestern culture. So how to balance that safety, again, with autonomy and respect, um, but, you know, ultimately how to remove the firearm from the situation in a safe manner. So I'll post that well, one. I in did, the chat. Yeah, I was just going to ask what that one was called again. That's great. That's also something, you know, as part of part of an intake, I often ask about access. Like, do you own? Do you have access? How do you store them? What's your training with them? That's not necessarily specific to are you suicidal, but just as part of a general threat assessment. It's, you know, and saying like, we can talk about this. And Kristen says, one of the strategies we use with students is having them role play assessing for suicide and creating a plan for safety. Faculty give students feedback on how they bring up the discussion, ask the question and support the partner. 
we're doing research on it and looking at their self-efficacy with suicide assessment. That's fantastic, Kristen. Yeah, those role play, I mean, there's nothing like role play, like let's move into actually sitting in this energy. What would you actually say in a safe place where you can get the feedback from your, maybe your student partner saying like, well, when you asked it that way, I felt this, or, you know, when you asked it that way, I wanted to open up to you more. And that's such good immediate feedback from student partner and faculty. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and role plays are a huge part of what we use in training for the crisis line. Um, it is standard throughout the training. Our, our crisis counselors are going through role plays, um, but then they have to pass a series of six role plays before they're allowed to be on the lines and interacting with clients. Um, and I mean, that's the thing is being able to just engage in the process of role playing, but also figuring out um, the reactions, getting feedback, processing that, that's um, been so important to the growth in our program and the growth of our counselors. Um, yeah, thank you, Kristen. I might actually wanna connect with you about what you're doing around that self-efficacy because that's what I'm researching, so. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, let's get into the interactive part. Um, as you feel comfortable, I'm going to encourage you in this next part to um, drop comments in the chat, to come off mic, hopefully one at a time, but uh, really just give your feedback. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some information on the screen about a client. Um, this is based on an actual client that I worked with. I've changed, obviously, a lot of details to protect their, their privacy, but um, this does come from a real scenario. And when we get your feedback, you do not have to give us like a fully formed idea of exactly what you would do with this client and all the steps you would take. I just want you to throw out what is going through your mind what are the things that come up for you um, what are the things that you're noticing what emotions are you having what details about the the scenario stand out that kind of thing um do we have a question i see somebody come off mic okay all right so i'm gonna get us started and like i said just you know share with us what are the things that come out for you? What are the things that stand out for you? Um, and we're going to kind of process together how we would ethically um, approach the situation that we're in. So Martin was referred to you for counseling from the local emergency room. Last weekend, he attempted to kill himself by hanging himself from his closet door, but the makeshift rope that he had used had broken. He was medically cleared by the emergency room doctor. The emergency room social worker was trying to get him into an inpatient placement, but all of their beds were full. They decided to discharge him with referrals to you and to a psychiatrist for medication evaluation. Martin has no previous diagnoses that the hospital is aware of um, and was on no medications at his time of being seen. What are your thoughts? Just based on that little bit of information, what's going through your head? You're welcome to come off mute or put your thoughts in the chat. Hello. Hi, William, go ahead. Uh, my first thought was, I guess you'd want to find out like what changed, like what maybe took place that weekend that he felt he needed to, what came up in his life. We also see in the chat, uh, Kristen would want to assess for the events leading up to that time, uh -huh, which goes to what you're saying, William, what changed, what's going on, Jessica, um, that his care should have not been transferred to you so soon. There's too much that is unknown. Yep, wanting to know the antecedents. Yeah. Great wonderings. 
Okay. Yeah, so then, uh, oh, ask if he can identify any reasons for living. Yeah. So even moving beyond the, the attempt itself, um, is there anything he does have hope for? I think we see this a lot um, more often than maybe we would want to see it because they're just, we're seeing such an influx in mental health needs and the severity of it. So we are um, getting clients that maybe would benefit from an inpatient, but there just isn't room. And so, um, you know, they are being referred to us more and more. So one thing that I want you all to consider is the accessibility of hospitalization. Um, like I said, you know, the hospital is kind of that last effort to keep a client safe, but they're not always available. Um, coming from Iowa, I can tell you, unfortunately, Iowa had the lowest number of inpatient psychiatric beds available in the continental U.S. Um, we weren't doing so good. At least that was uh, pre-pandemic. I don't know where we stand after the pandemic. But it was so hard to get a client into an inpatient bed, even if they needed it. Um, and it was not unusual for mobile crisis. We'd get called to the emergency room because they'd have a client that had been sitting in the emergency room on a cot in the hallway for two or three days and they didn't know what to do. And so they would call us in to see if there was any possibility that we could um, work with the client and figure out a safety plan for them to go home or go to another option. We have crisis stabilization beds in Iowa, which are a community-based safety option. Um, but sometimes it was like, no, this person isn't safe to go home. We really think they need to be here, but they're stuck in limbo. Uh, Lindsay said, yeah, running into situations like this all the time working in Kentucky. I know, yeah, we were there right with you, Kentucky, Iowa, we were right there with you. Um, yeah, uh, Jessica said, this is where minute to minute now our safety planning is needed and we need to advocate for bed for him somewhere. You know, if he at that stage where he really needs that monitoring all the time. So the interest of time, I'm going to move us forward a little bit, but I think one of the things we identified is that we just, we don't know a lot about Martin, right? Um, we don't know who he is. We don't know, you know, where does he come from? Uh, what's he like? What's his personality like? Um, we don't really have that much detail about past psychiatric history. I mean, just because the hospital says they don't know anything doesn't mean that there isn't a past history there. Um, we don't know how old he is. I purposely did not tell that to you um, and how old he is and his even just his uh, cognitive level can impact the way that we work with him and the things that we set up for him. We don't know about past history of attempts. We don't know if this is, you know, his first attempt or maybe he has attempted suicide in the past, but it hasn't risen to the level of hospitalization. We don't know anything about his home environment. We don't know who he lives with. You know, um, is he a student living in a dorm room? Is he an adult living on his own? Is he a dad with a family um, or is he a child with his parents? Um, is he a child? not with his parents, so things like that. We don't know if he brought himself to the hospital or not. Um, so did he, did the rope snap and he decided, oh, you know, I need help, I don't want this, and he brought himself in for care? Or did a family member find him and get him to the hospital? Or maybe was he involuntarily taken to the hospital by ambulance or by police? A lot of you brought this up. What happened? What happened to him? What kind of pain is Martin in that he thought that death was the only option available to him? Or um, 
So really wanting to hear his story, hear what he's experiencing. Can he stay safe, right? Was he ready for discharge? Can he stay safe at home? Um, what supports are available to him at home, if any? Um, and how do we know that he's not just going to attempt again? And then finally, do we know that he doesn't just need inpatient? Kind of like Jessica was hinting at is like, what level of risk is he at? We have no idea. Um, an inpatient may actually be the best placement for him. We don't know that. So this could be a really scary referral to get because of all the unknowns. But I think as people have said, this happens all the time um, where you'll get a referral with a client from a hospital um, with very little information. And it doesn't mean that the hospital is doing a poor job or that they're you know, trying to be shady. It's just that they're overwhelmed and they're just trying to do the best that they can. Um, but unfortunately, that leaves you in a very uncomfortable place of not having a lot of information about this client. So I'm going to give you a little bit more information, and then we'll see what you think. Uh, so Martin comes to your office for his first appointment, and he is joined by his parents. Martin is 14 years old. He lives with mom and dad, as well as two younger siblings. His family is Latino, uh, they are Spanish speaking and they're Catholic. His mother is a first generation American whose parents were from Mexico and his dad immigrated from Mexico. Uh, so mom and Martin are fluent in English, but dad speaks very little. Um, mom is the one who fills out most of the intake paperwork. And when you invite Martin back into your office, both the parents come with you. Again, what is running through your mind here? You don't have to come up with a plan. You don't have to come up with what you would do. Just what are the things that stand out to you in this scenario? Yeah, so we know he's got at least some supports at home because he's got his parents, but we don't know how healthy those supports are or what that support kind of looks like. Um, we don't know how mom and dad are taking this suicide attempt, how they're reacting to him. Um, so that's still an unknown for us to explore. There may be cultural differences. Um, you know, we've got a lot of cultural information here in terms of you know, the family's religious background, their language use, um, their cultural background and ethnic identities. Um, so these are things to think about when it comes to you as a provider, right? I don't speak Spanish. So I immediately am going to feel bad that I can't talk to dad. And mom and Martin would have to act as translator for dad, which is an awkward place for dad to be in. And it changes the whole counseling dynamic for the family there. Um, so, you know, that's something to think about is like, oh, you know, am I actually the right counselor? It's not that I don't want to work with Martin, but like maybe finding a Spanish speaking counselor would be best for this family, who knows? Uh, legal age of consent, Martin is a minor. Um, so what he can consent to, is different. He's got different um, privileges when it comes to privacy and confidentiality. His parents do have some rights when it comes to what's talked about in counseling, and you're going to have to navigate that. Um, also, levels of privilege. I mean, talking about that they are um, an immigrant family, or you know, have immigration as part of the family history. There, you know, do they understand the United States system? Um, are they familiar enough with it to be able to ask questions and to navigate it in a way that's best for their family and best for Martin? Um, you know, did they maybe get, so sometimes happens, did they maybe get dismissed at the hospital because they didn't have an interpreter available? Um, or maybe there were some assumptions there that, you know, stem from racism and things like that. So those are all things to consider when working with this family. Um, yeah, William had said what stressors are in Martin's life for him to attempt, what pressures are he facing, um, his age is definitely going to play a part in that too, in terms of his um, 
skills and his ability to adapt to different pressures and stress because he's learning and he's developing. Um, what pressures he's feeling due to his culture, maybe some cultural expectations there, especially as an older sibling. Um, are the pressures on him just being an older sibling? The need for a translator to communicate with all parties, be in support of the family. Uh, how comfortable is Martin discussing issues with his family present? I'm going to tell you right now, most teenage clients do not want to talk about things like suicide in front of their parents. Um, it is rare that they want to really open up and be honest with you with mom and dad in the room. Um, oh, Kristen brought up a good point. Being aware of your own feelings regarding being a parent of a child. Um, so when I'm working with our counselors on the crisis line, I we do have a lot of parents who are on our crisis line as counselors. And a consistent conversation we're having during um, supervision time with them is talking about like, how does this make you feel as a mom or how does this make you feel as a dad or as a parent or guardian, like that that could have been your child that came on the crisis line and is telling you they're thinking of suicide. Um, so just being aware of all that comes with that. Making sure dad doesn't feel left out due to the, the fluency and not being able to speak English. Um, does the age of 14 make a difference in not getting a bed at the hospital? Yes. So there are different units for inpatient psychiatric care. There are adult units, and then there are um, typically teen and child units. Sometimes it's just a, a minor's unit where it's eight, you know, below 18. Other times there are like specific teen units or spe specific younger child units. Um, there are even less beds for adolescents than there are for adults. Um, like I said, Iowa, we weren't doing so great. I remember we used to have to send families and children and children to Nebraska for inpatient beds um, because the ones in Iowa were just too full. Uh, what are things like at school? Are there guns in the home when they go do go home? Is there any cultural stigma around mental illness and suicide? Um, you know, things like that. So. Yeah, a lot of great points that you guys brought up. So I know we're getting low on time here, so I'm just going to keep going. Um, but all of these, these things about Martin that we've now found out that add to our assessment and to the decisions that we might be making around his care. So after the initial introductions and explaining the counseling process, you go through that whole informed consent process with mom and dad, mom's translating, we'll say in this case, although again, best practice would be a Spanish speaking counselor or having an interpreter in the room. Um, but after that, mom and dad are gracious and they agree to leave the room so you can talk to Martin alone. A lot of parents won't do that, so <laughs> just be aware. Um, it takes a bit, but you are an amazing counselor and you know your stuff. And Martin does decide that, yeah, he's ready to open up with you during this initial session. Also not going to be a very common occurrence, but hey, we're going to play play that role. Uh, so he tells you that he tried to kill himself because his boyfriend broke up with him the night before the attempt. His parents do not know that he is gay. And he is very worried that he, they will reject him because of the family's faith. Um, in his words, he doesn't know how to stop being gay and he's conflicted about it. Um, he does not want his mom and dad to know. And he's terrified of going through life um, in situations like where the breakups happen and he can't tell them. Um, he tells you that he's normally really, really close with his parents. He tells them everything. They have a really good relationship. And so keeping this secret from them, especially keeping the boyfriend from him, um, has just been really weighing on him. Um, and then the breakup was just, that was the, the hair on the camel's back. Um, he really doesn't see a hope for the future, and he tells you that he really thinks suicide is his only way out of the suffering that he's in. So now, what are you thinking?
Yes, how much of his religious background adds into this? Uh, I didn't tell you specifically much where his faith lies and where he is with his beliefs, but he does know that, you know, we do know that his family's faith is important to them. And that's part of the reason he decided to be quiet about his identity. And we are going to be uh, running up to the time period here. So um, get the last couple of thoughts and I'll wrap us up. Yeah, Chandra says he really isn't at a higher level of care because he's just thinking suicide's the only way. Um, the considerations about coming out to his parents, um, building trust to see if he'll be open to coming back, exploring any protective factors but he is really high risk. Um, and yeah, being worried about sending him home, even sending him home with mom and dad, is he going to try to take steps to get away from them and act on his thoughts? Um, so we won't go all the way through the scenario today, but I bring this up because like I said, this is an actual client that I worked with. Um, and what was cool is that when working with him, it turns out, even though mom and dad um, did have this very strong faith, um, they actually had no issues with his sexuality when he uh, ended up coming out to them. And um, we spent a lot of time in counseling, working through this idea of him coming out and explaining to him about the breakup and the suicide attempt and um, just this fear that he had. And then he comes out to them and they're like, oh, well, we love you anyway, that's fine. And he almost got angry because he was like, I just stressed about this and it led me to thinking about suicide and you're okay with it? Um, yeah, just like Dr. Calarusa said, sometimes clients create these scenarios in this head and how terrible things will be. And so, um, but what I, I wanted you to get from the scenario is how quickly these things can get messy. Um, and I'm not even going into all of the details of the things happening with this family. So just recognizing and realizing that when we're talking to people about suicide, we are talking to people. Um, and these conversations are messy and they are complicated and they are tough. But if you've got a really solid handle, knowing what you're doing, um, really solid handle on how you're going to make ethical decisions around having these conversations and assessments and safety planning, then you're going to be able to handle the messiness, right? You're going to be able to handle the things that the client throws at you. Um, and so really making sure you've got that strong foundation of understanding your ethical responsibilities, understanding your legal responsibilities, understanding all the potential nuances there. That way, when client or family throws a curveball at you, you're prepared and you're ready. Um, yeah, uh, you know, the alternative is that he, he did find out that they loved him regardless and, you know, they loved him so much. And to, to the parents, I mean, that was what mom broke down and cried about was she was like, I cannot imagine losing you. That was the scariest moment of my life. And I think that was a moment for him to realize like, oh, okay, they really do love me so it was a really wonderful case I love the conclusion of that one um and I wish Martin wherever he is the the very best of life luck in life um so yeah I'll stick around as long as the zoom room is open to answer any questions but I really do appreciate your guys's um participation and being willing to have this conversation with us Thank you. Thank you both so much. Such a good, I feel like we could, we could continue talking about this for hours. <laughs> um, such a good training. Thank you. Unfortunately, we cannot stay open um, or else we won't be able to get into our next session, but thank you so much. I don't see any unresolved questions in the chat. Um, and so thank you so very much. Um, thank you, participants. Thank you, speakers. And I hope everyone has a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.